Hello. Today, we're going to take a table full of bits and pieces and we're going to turn them into a fully functional Tag Micro CNC mill. So I'm really glad you're here to join in. Okay, let's get started. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clean these two mating surfaces. This is really important because any debris that gets inside of here could affect the squareness of your machine. So I'm just going to use some WD-40 and I'm going to clean these up. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to take off this nut. This is a 22 millimeter nut. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the column onto the shaft here and we're going to square it up and the plan is to snug up the bolt so that it can't move but we don't want to make it too tight because we're going to need to adjust it later on okay, so I've got it tight by my hand the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tighten it up with the ratchet but I'm going to hold the ratchet by the top that's going to make sure I don't put too much force on it okay snug that up there's not much movement there but we'll still have enough slot to be able to adjust it later on let's rotate the machine slightly so we can get a better look the aim here is to get the z-axis z-axis completely perpendicular with the bed the correct tool to use for this step is a machinist square that's a really accurate square I don't have one but I will link to one in the description if you want to pick one up for yourself I'm going to use the square that I do have to ensure that this is perpendicular with this I put the square up against the spindle. I can actually feel that there's some travel here, so these are not perpendicular. So I need to adjust the column slightly so that these two do run at perfect 90 degrees. To get the adjustment you want, you can either force it by hand if it's loose enough to do that. You could also get a hammer and just tap on the rigid part of the machine so you can move it like that. Make sure if you do tap the machine, don't do it on a flimsy part and don't do it on a precision part don't do it on one of these ways don't do it on the headstock you want to tap it on the frame itself at the back and that'll move it without damaging any pieces of the machine once you have things where you want them pretty happy with that there i'm going to tighten it up You don't want to over tighten this nut, but you want to put enough tension on it that it won't move and that it won't move while it's cutting metal as well. There'll probably be a bit of force exerted on the column as it moves, but you don't want to over tighten it. With the column all tightened up, now we can start getting to work. Safety is always paramount, so once this is snugged up, you can start to move around it some more, but I would not want to get my hands in the way of this column in case it could fall down until I'd done that. I have seen some horror stories where people have said this has swung down and it's broken something or it's put a nice big gouge in the bench. You don't want that. Make sure it's nice and tight to work on but not over tight. So now I'm going to fine tune the precision on the machine. So the plan is to put a one, two, three block on the left, one, two, three block on the right, and then going to put a precision indicator a dial indicator in the collet there i'm going to sweep this around the table and i'm going to make sure that there's no run out between the left block and the right block and if there is we're going to fine tune perpendicularity of the column once more so that it's perfect but to bring the z-axis up to do that i'm going to turn the ball screw and you can see actually it moves very easily just using my fingers all right a quick change of plan so i didn't buy a tramming arm with my dial indicator I feel a little bit stupid, but it's a good chance to get inventive. So I'm going to mount this in here like this, and I'm just going to put a mirror or a phone or something so I can see the gauge from underneath. And that'll have to do. I can always come back and refine this later, but that's my plan and I'm sticking to it. I'm actually quite impressed with myself now. What I've come up with is I'm going to use the Saunders vise, the mirror film at finish, to reflect the dial gauge. And now I've got the gauge on this one, two, three block, and I've got this zero. Now it's hard to believe, but I can actually see that dial really well. It doesn't show in the video but it acts just like a mirror. So I can see zero in my gauge. I'm just gonna turn my indicator, see if it moves. So front to back, I'm getting no noticeable change in the value. It's, that's incredible for a small machine. It's not even moving barely at all. Maybe one thou. Let me move this to the other side and see if it breaks from zero. So again, no noticeable difference front to back, but I am seeing a different value here than I was seeing here. So this is staying around about two, 
that was staying right on zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip these blocks to see if it's just the height of the block that's actually not ground perfect. So this block also is right on two. So that tells me there is still just a small amount of difference between left and right. That means this column is not quite perfect. So I'm going to have to move it slightly. This is higher on this side than it is on this side. Okay, I've just readjusted my column. I've reset zero on this side. Let's move it across. I am really close. Just it just a little more. Incredible. So that is how you use the mirror finish on a Saunders Machineworks jaw to align your machine. Now if we wanted more accuracy we would go wider. So the larger gauges that fit up here, they have two gauges either side and they have a wider stance. This is not the best way to do it. I'll post some pictures so you'll be able to see them in the video of the right thing to use. But I'm a big fan of doing things that make sense for me and that are affordable. This does work. It is a bit cowboy, but I'm really happy with that. I'm just going to snug up the machine. Now I'm going to remove the headstock with a 4mm hex wrench because I want to test how square the dovetail is behind the headstock. Make sure you support this as you undo it, otherwise it's going to crash to the table. Once I've undone that, I have access to the dovetail. Next up, we're going to test the squareness of the dovetail. I've set up a fixed indicator and I'm going to turn the ball screw by hand and we're going to see if this moves over the length of the travel. That didn't move at all. The dial indicator is definitely working, so I'm really impressed with the accuracy. Time to put the headstock back on. You can see what holds it on. There's a hex nut there, holds that clamp. Time to mount our motors. These mounts are how we connect the motors. These screw on to the threads on the ball screw. There's a collar on them with a grub screw. So once you've threaded them on, then you can use that as a clamp to make sure that they don't move. And this plate here is just shy of the end of the tube. And that makes sure that this seals onto the motor and holds this in position. You'll need to loosen the grub screw in order to get the collar to slide over. This is a five thirty seconds hex wrench. So I have a close-up of the end of the ball screw on the z-axis and before I put the final mount on I just want to explain how these couplers work. This is the end that goes on the motor. See there's four holes in there and there's four holes also in here and the way this connects is this pipe you saw in the first video. So this pipe will be cut into small sections and it will go in here and then the other half will put, poke into this. The reason they do this is they say if something shears, the machine doesn't break, then it just cuts this pipe. The other thing is it aids with acceleration. This is quite stiff and it will be certainly stiff in small lengths. So I'm going to cut this into multiple pieces and I'm going to slot it into the ends of the parts that go on the motor. Then we'll get these mounted to the motor. Now one complaint that I've heard is that because this tubing is curved, that it becomes very difficult to connect the other half of the coupler because these all want to go in their own directions. So I found a little trick. What I did was I wrapped the tubing around a very small Allen wrench. I just heated it with a, with a lighter and that just kind of stress relieved it, made it straight and you can pinch it with your fingers as well just to reshape it. And when they're a little straighter they go in a lot better. Another person as well on the forums actually suggested cutting these at an angle on the end so that it's easier to thread them in. Let's talk stepper motors for a split second. These are NEMA 23 3.5 amp 381 ounce inch stepper motors and they have a dual shaft and that's so that I can put a little wheel on the end and I can turn this mill manually if I want. I bought these motors because they're the biggest motors that I can drive with the Gecko G540 so these are the ones that work for me. You could go shorter but you would lose holding torque. We'll need a 4mm Allen wrench for this and we're going to put the coupler on the end of the shaft. We're going to clamp it in. The shaft of the stepper motor should be just at the bottom of the bore. Now let's feed in our pieces of tubing. You can see some of these sticking out and not quite straight. So you just straighten these up by heating it, as I showed you before. It actually went right in. So what I've found is that these are a little bit too far away to join. So I can undo the grub screw and I can move this mount back. As the motor plate is threaded, I'm going to screw from the motor side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to alternate corners, just like when I would put on a car tire. And that's to try and keep the pressure even on this mounting plate. 
You can see I'm finished now and I can't turn any part of this by hand so I feel like we've done a good job. So we're going to repeat that twice more, once for the y-axis motor down here and the z-axis motor right at the top. At this point we've completed the basic assembly of the mill. What we need to do now is mount the motor and that fits on this post. Both of these hex head screws have to be removed in order to mount the motor. The motor is heavy, so ideally get a second person to help you. And make sure you don't have to hold it at a strange angle because you're putting it on camera. These screws use a four millimeter hex wrench. You just want to snug these up because we're going to tension them in a moment for the belt. To mount your belt, you're going to swing in the motor towards the headstock pulley. And I'm actually going to put this in a fairly central position. I know I've read on some forum posts that if you try to put this on the highest speed right away because the grease hasn't loosened up, it's going to struggle. So I'm going to start in the central position. The smaller the pulley here, the faster this is going to go. Swinging the motor out gives me some tension and I can tighten things up. At this point I'm ready to plug in the motor, so I'll take the motor power cord and I'll connect it to the end of the cable that comes out of the top of this switch. At this point we're ready to test the spindle. I'm going to take off the collet nut because I don't have a tool in the motor and when I spin this up I don't want the collet nut to fly off and hit me in the face. Alright, time to be brave, let's turn on the switch. First thing that hits me is, this thing's quiet. I'm actually really impressed with the noise level. Ladies and gentlemen, we built a mill. Now we want to turn CNC ready into CNC, so what we need to do is take each of our motors and plug them into the right place. We have a final slot for an A axis, we might use a fourth axis for a rotary table, and so we have space to expand with one more motor. Now I'm going to connect my magic little garble box. I think it's about time we turn this on. Well, you know what? We built a mill and it works. Pretty happy with that. What a result. If you're a little stuck, if you're building your mill or a mill like it, feel free to drop some comments in the section below. One thing I'll also note is, especially for the take, there are really vibrant communities of people that either already have machines or want to buy machines. And there's always conversations going on about them. So I would really encourage you to seek out some of these user groups on Facebook or various other social media platforms and connect with people that can also offer you some advice. I really encourage you to post in the comments if you found tips or tricks that you found helpful. If you've got any other ideas about how I could have done this better, post it in the comments section below so people can learn from it. We can all benefit from advice, certainly I can. So I'd really appreciate people that are smarter than me leaving a few breadcrumbs to follow. I may post a video when I get some chips flying and show you this making some first cuts, but for now, thank you very much, over and out.